My name is Gabriel. I started with Scala in 2008. I mean, we didn't have even the book. I had to learn from the, from the, the language specification. Uh, and after, I mean, after years of Java, that was, anyway, that was really cool, the new languages. And obviously, the, the object orientation part of Scala, the like better Java, was fine by me. I can get, get it very easily. But the functional part, it was different, kind of uh, complicated. Uh, but it was fascinating for me. I mean, I kind of fascinated by the functional programming. And when you start functional programming, you, st you start, everybody starts mentioning Haskell. And when you start looking into Haskell, you, st you start seeing weird things you never saw. People talk about like things that sound really weird. And start, people start mentioning category theory. And when you go anywhere, uh, try to find out, I mean, any book or reference about category theory, especially like Wikipedia, you read Wikipedia, and if you don't know the, if you don't know what you're reading, you don't understand it. If you know it, it's perfect, it's easy. But if you are trying to learn, that is like totally unscrutable. <coughs> so, but for starters, uh, what's the most important technique for programming? What do you think? Both. <laughs> yeah, but for me, I started with abstraction. And I will address composition later. Why? And um, what is category theory? It's abstraction taken to the max. Abstraction to 11. This is category theory. You remove everything. But something that is really, really abstract that mathematicians invented to get away from, you have the set theory, but you have this, the, the Russell paradoxes, and they try to create like a new theory to explain the, mathem the mathematics without getting those paradoxes. That's fine. But the strange thing and the fascinating for me is like all this, this thing that they invented, that like direct application for programming. And um, obviously, I, if you go try uh, to understand what is, what is around, um, having the, the basic vocabulary allows you to go a lot. I mean, like starting from scratch, trying to crack that thing is, at least for me, it was really difficult until I had, uh, I was lucky enough to take like one semester back in my university. And it was, but that wasn't so difficult because somebody was explaining to me in words I can understand. <laughs> okay, this is, so the basic thing is what's a category? Yeah, the very abstract terms is like things and connections means the things. And that's it, that's it. And because we don't care about what real, really the things are, we really care about the connections about the structure of the thing. What we ask for a, in category, to have a category, is those connections, I, have, I need to have two things. Identity, like every object is connected by itself, and composition means if I have this connection and that connection, it's the same as having that connection. That's the only thing we want in a category. If you want more formally, uh, we have a, a category is a collection of objects and a collection of arrows or morphisms. morphisms. Uh, that for each pair of objects of the category, F from A to B means F belongs to the um, set of arrows from one object from A to B. That's basically like formally saying what I already say in, in other words. Uh, composition, if I have one arrow that goes from, one, from A to B, another arrow that goes from B to C, 
then the composition goes from A to C and exists. Again, I ask for an identity. That means there exists an arrow that goes from any object to, any, to the same object. And there's a couple of laws uh, we had to, to abide. Uh, basically, and those kind of more than laws are like, it, from the definition, the, the, the can be easily deducted. But basically, if it doesn't matter where you compose the identity, you know, it always does anything, <laughs> does nothing. You always said F composed with identity, give you F, or the, the ID in the other, in A, in B composed with F, also gives you the same F. And the composition is associative, it doesn't matter if you compose first one or the other, it's the same. But again, why does matter what is useful? And the thing is, the most useful approach is, okay, this is my functional program. I have my types. I have functions between those types. And the interesting idea is use a category to model, model that. It's kind of a flow. So, uh, I think the most interesting results from category theory are when we take the types as the objects and the functions as the arrows. There has, we have disclaimer. Yeah, some restriction may apply. It's valid only when the functions are total. Results are valid in the context of fast and loose reasoning is morally correct. What that means, uh, all this applies when you ignore things like exceptions, uh, non-termination, nulls. Um, so it's an ideal world of uh, pure functions that are total. But uh, there is a paper that's called Fast and Loose Reasoning is Morally Correct that takes the hard work of mapping, it's applied to Haskell, it takes the hard work of mapping like an ideal category and like a real world and try to reason that why, try to explain why the results are still valid. <coughs> that's why this, this is the name of the Piper and that's why you, you, sometimes you hear about the morally correct reasoning in, in functional programming. There's a little more, we have more things in a category. There is uh, sometimes, not all categories, but some categories have initial objects. That means for every object they have in my category, there's only one arrow that goes from that object to the, from the initial object to any other object. And conversely, I have the final object that from every object that is a unique arrow that goes to the final object. That's why the name. Uh, and the interesting thing is, in our previous category, in, category, in our category of types and functions, nothing is our initial object, and unit is a final object. Means uh, I cannot have a function, like a total function that goes, uh, any function that goes from nothing to any type is unique. And uh, again, all the functions that go to that ends that returns unique are unique. But I mean, that is not the only category we can build in with our programs. Uh, I, I actually I got the, this example yesterday um, when I Stephen talk about uh, the assumption. Uh, you can take the objects against our types, our arrows, our extent, or width. And basically, it's like a, your model, your hierarchy of types, uh, the extension, like some types and objects as a category. You have the identity that, again, a type is kind of 
can be substituted, was substituted by himself. And again, if I have the composition, means I have one type that can be replaced. If I have A, I can replace B, and B can replace C, then A can replace C. And if you remember, the Scala object hierarchy, our initial object will be any, or no final object will be nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to, to show. Um, in, if you move, if you are thinking on types and functions, uh, your initial object is nothing, and your final object is unit. Because uh, you are in the categories objects and functions, and basically, in this, if you think a function, a function, a total function cannot return nothing. You cannot like build an arrow from A to zero. But this is a dif different category. Uh, so in this case, nothing is our final object that is the subtype of all the other objects. Also, it's interesting. Uh, if you take a category and reverse all the arrows, actually the result not only makes sense, the result is another category, and it's called the dual category. And usually they put co uh, before. And it's the basic of understanding everything that says co, like co product, um, what do I say? Uh, I have different examples. Uh, well, monad, commonad. I didn't want to mention monads because I don't want to. I didn't want to say much about that. But uh, every time you see co, you, it means the same category is the dual category. You reverse the arrow, and it's again it's another category. So all the category theory results apply. But we have more things. <laughs> And that's the other these things uh, make sense because they are first they're applied directly to uh, our modeling of programming languages, and they they are used a lot in the in the like in the literature and everybody. If you start looking about functional programming, a product. Basically, you take two objects from the category, you mash it together, and you get to be a product, you need two functions to extract the values of that product. And there is to be a real product, it has to satisfy this um, property. That means uh, this arrow must be unique. And basically, the composition of that unique arrow with the projections will give you the initial functions. <coughs> that's, okay, that's totally mathematical construct. But actually, any, any time you're using multiple parameters in a, in a, in a type, you're using this approach. That's why it's called a product. Here is like any, P, whatever. If you have like two parameters, it's kind of, what we're trying to represent in Scala, the case class, p dot a and p dot b will be your projections. I mean, this is, as I didn't say, this is called projections. Uh, a tuple, a tuple also is, is even. If you look around to a tuple, it's called product. But also, I mean, cons, I mean, adding to the list is also a product because we have one. One type on one, that, on one side, another type on the other side. Does it make sense? No. I'm confused. Okay. okay. <laughs> what part? Everything? Well, uh, you started running the word projection. What exactly do you mean by projection? 
Yeah, sorry. Projector are just these two arrows. Like you get the product and you have the one projection will extract one, a, one of your original values and the other projection will suck the other, the other value. It's like a selector. Yeah. Again, you can think. Yeah. And you know, probably, uh, I try to not to say anything wrong, but if you think uh, in the database relational model, uh, a selection is a projection also, it's called, even in the, in the relational theory, it's called projection. Basically, it's a product of A and B. A cross. Yeah, A cross B, whatever. The cross product, I mean. It, I mean, uh, this is really, really abstract. I mean, in the, I think if you, I don't know, model category, vectors with categories, uh, you have the vector product, or if you have numbers, this is like multiplication, but. Go in. Okay. Not exactly like that, but uh, basically, uh, any time, I mean, in other languages, like a tuple is called a product also. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, now, if I if I say now after this it comes the coproduct, what do you think it will look? Yes, that's the thing. Okay, let's say coproduct is co. Do a category. Let's reverse the arrows. It's everything reversed. Will it make sense? I mean, let's see. Here we reverse everything. Instead of the projections, we have the injections. This, these arrows are called injections. Uh, again, we have F and G, but now they are reversed. Yeah. And then we have the, like the unique arrow that makes things. So again, we have uh, our coproduct that is sometimes is called sum with our injections that satisfies that now the injection is in the other side to make, uh, to match the types. So basically it's in, uh, or our unique arrow composed with, uh, with injection will give you our original. In Scala, it's again the, <coughs> it can be the either, it's, in this case it's like a, our own implementation, but basically it's alternative. Either in this case is our coproduct, one side holds the A and the other side holds the B, but it's how we represent uh, they call, even if you look in, like in Haskell or other, other types, they call the sum type. Sometimes you heard the complaint that Scala doesn't support like proper sum types. And also again, in Scala C, it's called the disjunction because basically it's like a disjoint, disjoint union. And I find kind of interesting that just by reversing the arrows, you get something different that is really, that makes sense. <laughs> Make sense? <laughs> so why are you using the word sum and coproduct for exactly the same thing? Uh, actually, coproduct is more uh, it's kind of it's more in the sense like you have uh, it's like the dual of the product. Uh, 
uh, probably I think some, I don't really know why they use some, probably it's by historical reasons. Like they try to explain this and this and this is the, the sum, but uh, I don't have any. So now to the famous Fontors. How many here about, hear about Fontors? How many know what they are? <laughs> okay, okay, at least lots of people hear about Fontors and okay, we have people like, they're, they're sure what they are. So if you go and try to read about like what are functors in category theory, yeah, you can hear about the structure preserving mappings between categories. You say, what? Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's try to, to find out what that means. Uh, we have, in a category we have objects and functions. So if we have, we want to map, we need to map the objects and we need to map the functions. Uh, we need to preserve the structure, but what structure do we have in a category? We didn't say much about what, but we only have uh, identity and composition. So any, the mapping of any function must match, obviously, the, the types of the function, type. I mean, the initial means the mapping of the function, the mapped function will start in the mapped initial object, uh, the mapping starting of that object, and the mapping of the final of the other object. That means I'm not going to move the arrows to any other place. The arrows will travel with the object in the mapping, and I need to, my identity in any object must be the the identity in the mapped object, and I need also to keep the map of the composition. So the map of two composed functions must be the composition of the map of each function. This is kind of formally what the Fontor does. And you know, have you ever think, uh, have you ever read about implementing a Fontor, uh, especially if you read about Haskell, uh, they talk about the Fontor laws, Fontor laws, and if you implement a Fontor, you basically need to uh, comply with these two things: preserve the identity, preserve the composition. Uh, so, but if you start reading about Fontor, you you hear about end of Fontor, and how a monad is just a a monad in the category of end of Fontor. The thing is, and the fontors, it's just uh, fontors where the source and tar target category of the fontor, where the mapping goes to the same category. And if we are talking about uh, programming and trying to model programs with fontors, this is the most interesting fontors because we apply a fontor and we still are, we still have programs and type. If not, we're just moving. To, I don't know, to the world. Yeah, I mean, we're dealing, what I'm thinking is a, a font, you can model, you can create a fonter from your category in your program to a category of uh, chairs and, and connections between chairs and people that use the chairs. But it's not really interesting because you're already out of, you're already out of programming then. But here is when it gets interesting. <coughs> uh, type constructor. It's actually uh, end of Fontor. <coughs> and basically, let's say I have my program, types, functions that go between types. And now I want to, instead of using the, instead of using just returning the direct types, now my functions are options because it might return known. And I want to write all my program using options instead of just using the type. Well, the structure is kind of the same. This is our, this is, we already say that this is a category 
and that looks like another category. There are two category. I mean, they are the same category in type to types in functions. So here we can use an uh, end of function. Or again, uh, may I want to use a future. Maybe all my functions are um, asynchronous, and I want that program, and I have this. And I don't want to rewrite everything. So, category theory to the rescue. <laughs> and I want to use uh, end of functor. I, got, I need to create my functor. So, okay, I say that the option is the, the type constructor is the mapping of the, of the objects. That makes sense if I take any type and apply the option constructor, I get option, the string, and option, the int, from string and int. But now what we do with the function? I have a function that goes through from string to int. And I need one function that goes from option, the string, to option, the int. Well, true, but I'm talking about the category where our morphism are the functions. Total functions. So I don't have any non-terminating problem. Uh, our objects are the types. So really, I have a function from A to B. And I want to create a function from option the A to option the B. Does anybody see where it's going, this? Really, if I put everything in one signature, I have one function A to B, and I need to return a function that goes from option the A to option the B. So if I generalize that, I get, I need, I have a function from, again, A to B, and I need to return F the A to F the B. Doesn't anybody recognize this signature? Hmm? Exactly. Bingo. F map. Well, in Scala, it's a little more horrible, <laughs> but <coughs> That's the, the famous uh, F map, where you take one function and something inside uh, a type, and it gets you, and that applies the function to the, to the object you have inside. And that's, the good thing for me is like, you, you have all the F map, map, you know what you have to implement, but it has a whole explanation of why uh, it has that signature. Ooh. One second. Because what comes later is more complicated. Um, so what do you think? Does it make sense for the map? It shows you. By the way, any questions or complaints? Yeah, I'm only explain this F map only maps the functions, right? right. Oh, yeah. What happened with the objects? Well, that's, again, if you see like the type class or, or whatever, nobody tells you. Actually, you are, with, if you have the type constructor, it's your mapping of the object. I mean, if you have an option, the option already tells you how to create an option of any type. And this is your mapping of the object. What it gets complicated is how you map the functions. And if you think, uh, obviously, the functor type class, if you can instantiate that, if you want to go to create a special uh, particular instance of that type class, that means you already have this one. You don't need to, don't need to provide the, how to map the functions. Actually, functors are one of the most interesting things because without you move from one category to another, 
And if you are in the same category, we are in the functors, is the one who allows you to work with uh, type constructors, <coughs> like any, basically any high, higher order type uh, is, is, a, is a functor. Natural transformations are really interesting too, because it allows you to move from functors to functors. Uh, obviously, it's kind of, you can create, a, uh, if you think functors is, are your objects, natural transformations are the arrows of that category. In category theory, everything forms a category and then you can reapply the same reasoning. Uh, this, is, this part is really abstract, but if, we, if you have like a family of, for any two functors that goes from one category to other, if you have a family of arrows that goes from one element of the functor to the other functor, that's called a natural transformation. And the really important thing is this part. That, that diagram is called commute. Everything in category theory is kind of proved with diagrams. And if the diagram commutes, you have like an equality. <coughs> and this is totally abstract. But if you have this, suppose you have a list, a sequence of elements, and you want to map about the, you want to map in, in that sequence. You have a function that goes to another functor. Let's say here an option that returns, take a sequence and returns an option. And you want to apply the same function, the same map. And then you start with a sequence of A and, and ends with an option of B. The important thing is that because it commutes, because it's a natural transformation, you have that here adoption of map of the sequence, of map in the sequence, is the same thing as mapping after getting the head option. <coughs> and that means if you can, basically that in this one, you don't go through all the list. This is like uh, more efficient and it's they're equal. In the sense, you get, it gives you the same result. I mean, you can have like the right rules about this. And the thing about natural transformations, it gives you um, something called parametricity that basically because the A and the B are, I mean, that really anything, <coughs> you can think of uh, the hidden functions doesn't need to know about what is really happening inside. And there is a, that is based on a, there's a paper, it's called the free theorems, that has many uh, results about parametricity, kind of like if you take the reverse, I mean, if you map something and then do the reverse, it's the same that reversing and then map or map. Uh, concatenation of two lists is the same of mapping in each list and concatenate. And it seems those results seem like reasonable, but the real justification explanation is because of that kind of diagram, parametricity. Well, after all this, conclusion. It's called uh, some, uh, even the people who do category theory, they call abstract nonsense, but it's because it's really abstract. But uh, if you start reading about functional programming, for me the fascinating thing is like all those things like are really, really abstract, you have, actually you have to implement it straightforwardly uh, in your code. And you get interesting results. Um, what you mentioned, when, when you say about the abstraction and composition, in category theory, it's so abstract, the only thing you have is composition. So that's why it's like a, also such an important thing. Well, if you are, you are I, have, I haven't made you sleep. Um, this, when you start, I've been looking at different books about category theory. 
And most of the times, you start reading the first couple of pages, and then start talking about very weird stuff. I mean, all the examples are from mathematics. And it's fine, but sometimes you're looking for something really straightforward. One thing I found, this is uh, like a undergraduate thesis from one guy. And it's, I found that really goes to the directly to the mapping, basically maps category theory uh, to Haskell and Agda. I will read in this book. This is uh, available also on the web. And this is interesting. It's more like uh, more, goes more deep and has more examples, but it's kind of more complicated. Uh, there's a lot of books about category theory, but this is kind of my, my recommendation. Uh, well, thank you. At least you did it right away. <laughs> <laughs>